Plains Angels is an initiative of the Greater Des Moines Partnership that connects Iowa-based angel investors with early-stage growth companies throughout the Midwest. Thank you everyone for being here. We've got a nice full room, that's a great thing. Uh, I'm Chris Sackett, I'm the, uh, the managing partner of Brown Winnick. Thanks for being here. We we're uh, pleased to have a nice full room, a really full room. Uh, it's a good thing we kept it where we did. Uh, uh, I think you're going to be really pleased with the, the presentations today and the, and the presenters. Uh, uh, Mike and I worked uh, pretty closely on, on kind of the format of this one, and, and uh, you've got a really good group of folks who have been through every aspect of kind of this entire process. So you've got uh, everywhere from service providers to uh, folks who've been in the trenches and are in the trenches and uh, on both sides at the front end and the back end. So I think you'll enjoy the presentations very much. Uh, in terms of just uh, uh, basic logistics today, restrooms will be will be out these doors. The, the men's restroom is out this door on the right, women's restroom out that door on the left. Other way. Or no, you're right. No. Sorry. <laughs> Joe's been going to the wrong restroom for years. Uh, uh, and and uh, let's see, we've got Wi-Fi. Hopefully that we've got the, the password on that. I'll we'll get that to you shortly. Um, with that, I don't really have much more in terms of, of logistics. We'll go ahead and get started. I think Mike Cole is going to start things off. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Chris. That's cool. All right. So he just did some logistics, but real quick, thank you. Um, Mike Cole with the Greater Point Partnership. Uh, I run Square One. Uh, so today's agenda um, is hopefully going to leave time for some good breaks. That was our goal. So we'll take a break in the morning. We'll take a break before lunch to get our food. We'll have a panel discussion at lunch, and then we'll go from there. I just asked everybody to uh, turn their phones to silent, if you would. The goal of the day is to do an overview. This is not a simple process. Um, for those of us who have done it a few times, we, we have this look of pain on our face like it is really not a simple process. But if you get some basics on how to do it, the order to do it, the documents you need, and more than anything else, the prep you need to do before you actually start that process. As an entrepreneur, it'll make your life a lot better. So our goal is by the end of the day for you to have a really good, sound appreciation for what you're facing. Um, the areas that you may be going, yep, I've got that, and the areas you may be going, I need to do a lot more work. So, um, thank you again to Brown Lake for <laughs> hosting some beautiful area and uh, providing us food and drinks and all the other things to make it nice here. Um, agenda. This morning we're going to talk just real briefly uh, about timelines and then we'll dive right in on a how to. We'll talk about the kinds of money, at what stage you're in. We're going to talk a lot about common mistakes. Uh, we're all humans, we're really good at making mistakes, it's how we learn, but you don't want to learn with an investor that says no to you because you made a mistake. We're going to talk some about financial stages, um, go through what financials you actually need to have and still run into the complex area. Talk about some of the materials you're going to want to have and what a one pager is, what a pitch deck looks like, um, how you ask, making the ask, uh, and then what initial terms. A lot of investing is being done through online platforms now, and it's something you all need to be aware of. Uh, I'm a big advocate of saying Iowa is 1% of the United States population, and we're less than 1% of the United States angel investors and VCs and seed funds, and we need to recognize that. So while we love raising money in Iowa, uh, you're going to have to look beyond that, and a lot of people are raising money through electronic platforms now, so you just have to be recognizing if you don't do those things, you limit your scope. We'll go through this again uh, after lunch, but after an agenda, finding and taking the money. Where is it? How do you do it? What's the process? How do you follow up and stay in contact while you're trying to raise the capital? How do you get ready for due diligence, which in, about, in and of itself is a, a very large, very complex process. Um, Term sheets, by the core document, one of the core documents of this whole process. Uh, negotiations, how to negotiate, uh, when to say no. Uh, what is a lead investor and why does it matter to you? Actually taking the money and doing it without causing yourself great pain and agony and visits from the SEC and other problems. What do you do after investment, which I would say as an investor, and I am an investor as well, is something that I would coach all of you as entrepreneurs. It's Days we'll say it later, but stay in contact, don't go dark. Um, and then just final wrap up, and we'll have a reception after. So that's the day. Uh, any questions on the agenda? All right. Um, if you're wanting to get on the Wi Fi, you can pass one of these around, but the codes are on here. Uh, I'll just send it around. Uh, would you just pass it around for those who need the Wi Fi codes? So let's talk about timeline. Um, just to set the expectations here. 
and this is depending on how much you're raising. Everything's depending on how much you're raising, where you are, all these things. Uh, really, a minimum of I'm actively going to start raising capital to I have money in the bank uh, in four months, and that's pushing it. That would be really, really fast. We have normal say, say six. Now, if you're doing a very small round with only three or four investors, you might be a little faster. But you need to assume six months going in. And sometimes it takes longer. Uh, so it just all depends on a lot of different things. Preparation will start the process. What you don't want to do is every time your investor asks you a question, say, I have to get back to you. What you really do want to do is have everything in place so you can say, yeah, I'll have it to you in the next 20 minutes for multiple reasons. The biggest one is your time, time frame, just being responsive, uh, being able to move the ball forward on the raise, but more importantly, looking like you know what you're doing. Uh, you, especially if this is your first time, uh, a lot of investors are a little hesitant around first time entrepreneurs. And one of the ways you get over that is being super prepared. And so much of the process is out of your control. Uh, get used to having no control. It's kind of like being stuck at a hub when the plane's late and you just gotta sit there. This is pretty much what it can be like. So I just want to warn you in advance that a lot of times you're gonna feel like this is totally out of your control. So that's the timeline. I don't want to spend a ton of time on that, but uh, that's the timeline. As the speakers come up today, I'm gonna to ask them to, to introduce themselves. Um, you have two handouts. Uh, one is the pitch deck from today. It's every slide that's up here. And the second one is two handouts we're going to talk about during the day, and then the biographies of all the people presenting to you today. So if you want to know more about them, rather than having them to get up here and tell you their life story, and mine would be very boring, um, you have that information. Uh, as far as uh, afterwards, if there's a document you want, if there's something you're looking for, um, square1dsm.com, uh, I will leave you my email address. Feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I think anybody that has registered today has the email. But uh, please reach out. We'll be happy to help you out if we can. So with that, we'll kick it off. Sheldon, we're going to have you come up and start us off today. Left and right. That'll be the hardest thing today. That'll be your hardest thing today. We'll leave right. Two choices. Um, First of all, thank you to Brian Winnick and to Mike Lowell for making this happen. Um, next thing is, I see some familiar faces out here, and I see some that aren't familiar. So I think uh, what I wanted to first start by saying was, how many people here are obviously not presenters, and who actually are looking to, uh, to raise money, or, or, or in, a, in a business that could raise money? Some decent amount. Let's start, let's start with this. How many people um, just have an idea? They only have an idea, so they haven't, uh, maybe they're still obviously working somewhere else, but they, they're just at the idea stage. One, two, three. Um, how many have started their idea? So some people call that like a minimum viable product. They're working on getting a minimum viable product. That's three. So who already has like a product? Okay, and that's really everybody else. And then of that group, how many have a product and then they have revenue? So half of that group. It's kind of half and half, so maybe 10 or 12. And okay, all right, well that's good, that's good. So with me, and I think with everybody, feel free to ask questions um, along the way. We have one while I'm here up here on my slide, feel free to either interrupt me or <laughs> so this slide is about the right type of money. And as I thought about putting the slide together, I just I decided to put it up instead of having two or three slides on this, I put it all on one <coughs> slide. And I think where we just started maybe tells you kind of where we're going. Um, if you're on the far left, you know, to me, and, and we may use a few different, you know, uh, words here, and that's, you know, normal. Um, but if you're on the left and you're at the bottom left, you're at the idea stage. And that may mean literally, you know, in your head. Obviously, the next thing you want to do is write it down, right? But um, at that point, the best you're going to do is put your own money in, right? Or some very, very close friends and family, right? You know, maybe you're in a company that does something, you thought of a better, 
we could say mousetrap, but a better way to do something that you obviously have some core knowledge of. Um, depending on where you work, how you work, you may need to leave that company before they accuse you of taking one of their products or services or secrets or, but anyway, the, you're at the idea stage, right? So that's going to be, to me, friends and family kind of money, your own money if you have it. Um, the next step is you're working on your minimum viable product. This may not mean it's going to be market ready. And again, when you're working on it, you may not sure what the end result of that initial development, if it's software or, or, uh, or uh, you know, prototype, if it's hardware or, or whatever the device or, or service may be. And that still may be friends and family, but some people would call that angel money, where you're probably starting to meet. You know, obviously by coming here today, you, meet, you, you know Mike, and hopefully you've heard about Plains Angels, and you know, there's other angel clubs around the state, maybe some of you are in other parts of the state. Um, so angels, and angels is really a group of people that are willing to invest equity, typically, in young or startup type companies. And you're going to go through a whole process today to hear more about what that would take. That, that's not my section. This is, just, uh, this is just the right type of money for the different states you're at. Um, so at the point where you actually have that minimum bio product, and I'm not sure if it's the next stage. I'm, just, I'm calling it product ready. I'm not sure if you have revenue or not. That's a whole other discussion whether you have revenue or not. You made a sale or not. But. Uh, at that point, some people would call that seed. Other people would still call that angel money. But you know, there's some angel money where five guys are going to give you five thousand dollars. Now you have twenty-five thousand to build that prototype. At seed, you're probably looking at a much bigger raise. You know, you maybe are raising fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, a quarter million dollars. As I look around the room, some of you I've been on that path with you in the last couple of years in this town, and you know, it's just there's just different stages of that process. And even if you have a minimum viable product, and maybe even have some revenue, you may realize that you're going to pivot. You may not realize you're going to pivot, but you may be changing your plans or changing your target market or changing how you're addressing uh, you know, your potential customer base, you know, even in these early stages. Sometimes, you know, we're not in Silicon Valley where maybe you're coming up with the next Google, right? But I just did read an interesting story. And Google very early on didn't know what they had. In the paper this last week. And they actually tried to sell the company early on before they launched for a million dollars and didn't have any buyers. And they came down to 750 and they couldn't get it sold. So they decided to kind of continue on their path. True story. It was in a publication this week or this last weekend. Sometimes you don't know what you have, but unless you have a lot of intellectual property, a lot of people talk about that means, but obviously things that are totally unique. Um, you don't usually get to start a huge valuation, you know, when you have just an idea or a product that may or may not have a competition. So we're kind of going through here, and then we'll start going a little faster. Your product's ready, you have some revenue, you're going to have a bigger angel round. Some people call that a seed. Some people would call the next round a post seed, and that means you're expanding your revenue. What I really want to get to, and I don't think there's anybody, that's, does anybody think about a Series A institutional round? We have one. Okay. Two, three. Wow, we have three people, so I need to speak to that. So now we're talking about some real money. You know, now we're probably talking about around. I don't want to put a number. I decided not to put numbers here, but it's probably at least a million dollar raise. It could be a five million dollar raise. It could be a ten million dollar raise. And what's going to be needed to do that? It's going to be, a, you know, you're going to be able to, to articulate and demonstrate and have uh, <coughs> customer testimonials that you have a product that is you know, J-curving, escalating, you know, skyrocketing, ready for full market expansion. Whether that's rolling the nationwide, whether it's quadrupling the capacity, whether, you know, another production line, you know, I, I mean, it just depends on the type of business, you know, we could be making liquor here, we could be making, you know, a rocket here, I guess, we could be doing lots of different things. But, um, so that is uh, the stages of the companies, and that's the type of money that you would raise at different stages. Sheldon, question for you. Um, should you concern yourself with which type of offering that you're making at the earlier rounds, like a friends and family round, whether 
you're looking at a 504 or 506 and how that would impact you and then also corporate structure? Could you speak to that at all? Well, I don't even know what a 504 or 506 is, so I need a lawyer probably to help me with that. <laughs> uh, but what was, what was the significance of that, Steve? Um, the ability to, uh, if you want to raise more than a million dollars over the course of a 12-month of a period, uh, you have to have all accredited investors as oh, part accredited of investors. Gotcha. security offering. Well, I'm definitely into accredited investors because that's going to protect you. Um, so uh, um, going back to the other part of the question was, was uh, it was uh, corporate structure. Yeah, so you're not going to get any investors, well, probably from here on, certainly at the Series A, unless you're a C Corp. So everybody kind of wants to be a LLC early or an S Corp. I have two, and the entities I own are all going to pass through losses that you know help early, you know, the, the, the main investor with their own taxes. Well, there's losses during the early stage, unless you're really lucky not to have losses, but you should almost plan on having losses in the beginning. But if you think you're going there, there's some tax implications. Now, what I'm not is a lawyer or an accountant, so I would say see your lawyer, your tax advisor to get expert opinion on that. There's a point where if, you're, if you think you have the product that's going Series A, there's a point where it's the right time to bite the bullet and convert if you start as an LLC or an S. And you'll want to check with the uh, virtually all the people in the back of the room, or the ground winning people, the LWBJ, or whoever your attorney or lawyer is. Can I answer your questions? <coughs> That's it for me. I don't think I have. I'm sorry. I clicked it inside. Mr. Sackick. <coughs> companies and, and some of the funds that invest in those companies and the individuals that found those companies, so hopefully for a lot of folks, certainly for some of the folks in the room and, and, uh, and for others like you. Uh, so in that role, uh, one of the things that I see are mistakes, and I wanted to talk to you about some of those and see if we can help you to avoid those. <coughs> so I've got to, I'd like this to be really interactive, so if you have any questions about what I've said, I kind of take a, a sort of a less formal approach to presentation, so if you want to chime in, if you have questions, comments, uh, disagree, agree, whatever, feel free to just jump in. Uh, so common mistakes, you know, remember this, this is a kind of a beauty pageant, right? and then one of the first things I see is, is poor corporate housekeeping. Uh, I kind of look at, at your company as, as uh, and your offering and, and uh, fundraising process as inviting someone over to your home, and they get to come in and they get to look under the furniture and they get to see if, if, if you've even got furniture and if, if the windows are broken and the locks work and that sort of thing. And so that starts uh, right right from your organization. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to be well done and thought out. So uh, I'm not a big fan of the legal Zoom type work uh, product. You can actually get a, a, a very inexpensive you know, corporate organization done by, by a good law firm where you have a solid base it will not be the base that you will stick with throughout the life of your company because it will change as you raise money. It will change as you bring on investors and grant additional rights. But you want people when they come in to see that you've thought things through and, you, and you've done it right. So poor corporate housekeeping. Not understanding your company. Uh, what I mean by that is in the process of, of fundraising and, and speaking with investors, you're responsible for everything uh, about your company. And you need to, both the things that are in your materials and the things that you bring up, but also the things you need to anticipate that someone else will bring up. Uh, and, and, and I will put a practical pointer. If, you, if there's something, uh, some blemish, some work, something that's bothering you about your company or your plan, you may as well simply embrace that because uh, the savvy investors will bring it up. So you need to make sure that, that you know everything about your company that you can now that does not mean that a prospective investor, particularly an experienced one, or somebody who's got experience strategically within your niche, will not ask you a question that you're not prepared for. That's okay too. 
if it's if it's a really good question, uh, if, it's, if it's a question from someone that you want to invest or it's a, a relevant question, you want to, uh, if you don't know the answer, don't try and guess. Tell them that you will check that out. It's a great question. Go do your research. Get back to them as promptly as possible. You got to understand your company, which means you understand your that industry and your plan. Valuation <coughs> and your capital needs, sources, and uses. Those kind of all go together. Uh, there's plenty of articles on uh, valuation of early stage companies. Uh, my view on valuation is, especially in, in a pre-revenue, uh, maybe even pre-product, maybe you're maybe not even a pilot yet. Uh, my view on valuation of that is, is it is much more art than science, uh, but I want you to show people that you've thought it through. Why do you think this is the valuation? And, and have something that is at least uh, logically defensible, rational, and well thought out. Also, you need to be willing to listen to other views of valuation because you are going to hear them. And when it really comes down to it, if you look at at what you, if your company is successful, um, that valuation number at the early stage is going to be a, a relatively modest number anyway. Uh, what's really going to drive the success of, of the company and your personal financial success as the owner of the company is less about whether it's worth a million and a half or a million and a quarter or a million and more about what you do on the revenue and growth side. So you need to understand your valuation and have a, an articulated and rational basis for it. but. Uh, be ready for, for people to chisel around the edges and probably make some pretty good arguments. Sources and uses um, what, uh, and capital needs. Uh, if you're going out to raise capital, one thing that I find to be really uncomfortable, whether I'm an advisor or a prospective investor or just somebody sitting in the room during a pitch, is when somebody says, well, we're kind of thinking we're going to raise like between like 500 and 5 million-ish. You know? <laughs> that to me means you have no idea what, what you need. And, and it's, it's, it's awkward, embarrassing, it's hard, to, it's hard to back away from that. You know, you, you've shown right away that you don't know. So there may be a range where you say, we have to, if we're going to do this raise, we've got to raise a minimum of $100,000, or these are all relative numbers, $50,000, $200,000. But why do you need that minimum? Because if somebody is going to be the writer of the first check, but not enough to get to uh, what they think or what you think is an articulated minimum, they, uh, they want to know what the minimum is, how you're going to get there, what, what you'll do with that. Now, you can have staged numbers. Like, you might say, if we get to $100,000, here's what we'll do with it. If we get to $200,000, that still makes sense in this raise, and here's why. Here's what we'll do with it. Uh, the other thing, so, so that's, that's kind, of, kind of the sources and uses and the, uh, and the, the need. The other thing to, to think about along those lines, and you can others will tell you about this in, in a little bit, but is that need depending on how early stage you are, is more expensive, right? So if you say, well, gosh, I could, I could do a whole lot if I had you know, $10 million right now. Well, most yeah. people could do more with $10 million than with $100,000. But are you ready for it? And do you want, do you want to pay for that with equity? Not understanding your strengths, your weaknesses, and, and, and your role. And, and here, I mean, I, you, I, uh, I mean you as the individual, as the founder, as the face of the company. Uh, there are folks out there who, there are folks who probably can do all of the things that are necessary for a company through a certain stage. Obviously, if you grow a company, no matter how talented you are, you need additional people. Um, but know what your strengths are, know what your weaknesses are. Uh, be prepared to address weaknesses. Weaknesses might just be gaps too, right? I'm a lawyer, I'm not an accountant. Uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm not an investment banker. I know a little bit enough about those things that I can uh, you know, speak on some of those topics, but I'm not going to practice in those areas. Similarly, if you are not a financial person, you have to have financial knowledge, uh, and you have to have, uh, uh, again, a, a plan that you articulate to these people as to how you will fill those gaps. And they might very well, a, a common, common uh, area that comes up is kind of uh, uh, finance. Well, if you're an early stage kind of startup, you know, kind of pilot stage company, you, I can, I was going to say probably, you don't want to hire a full-time CFO. If you do, that will be as bad as not having any financial plan at all, uh, because people will say you're, that money is flowing out to pay salaries. That's not good. But you have to have a plan as to how you're handling those those sorts of issues. 
how you plug the gaps, how you how you bootstrap until you get to the point where you uh, can fill those roles. The other thing that kind of plays into this would be there are some folks, uh, lots of us in the room have probably met them, um, who cannot look in the mirror and see their weaknesses. Uh, there are some folks, founders usually start out as the CEO, right? Some founders, and this impresses me when some founders will, will say this, when they will accept the fact that I, am, I may be CEO now, I am not CEO material for when we get this company to where I want it to be. Maybe I'm the chief technology officer. Maybe I'm the operations officer. Maybe I'm just the founder and the creative uh, mind. Uh, but, but there are folks who just stubbornly keep sticking to that position. Uh, and, and as I say this, uh, people faces kind of pop into my, my, my mind. <laughs> uh, well, I'm sure of those. Uh, but where you look at really good ideas, that were really good ideas six years ago, and now those same ideas are, are no longer fresh and new and exciting, but that CEO is still there uh, and still out trying to persuade people that uh, this person is good CEO material. Process and timing. This kind of goes back to, uh, to what Mike had talked about in his, his early slide. First of all, uh, in terms of timing, fundraising takes some time. Getting a plan makes some t takes some time putting together kind of your business plan and your executive summary that you will present to investors takes some time. And, uh, and so it will take those of you who are perhaps uh, the first time you've done this or are less well known or less well connected, you can plan that it will take you longer than it may. You may have heard of so and so <coughs> who raised uh, you know, $5 million and did it themselves and just did it through relationships and people like that. That person did it in three months. I can do that. Probably not. Uh, the other thing I would say is, is your timing uh, and the process is dependent upon your idea, but at least in, in this state, it's dependent upon which relationships you can establish or which relationships you can leverage. So there are people uh, who know people who know people, and they're the right people. They might not write you a check. But they might also, there, there are people who don't write checks in this state uh, you know, on, on every deal, but go and say to somebody else, hey, I don't really, this isn't my space, but I think you'd be interested. And uh, qualify that with kind of, kind of, a, kind of a, a quick caveat. That is, if you meet with every person that everybody tells you you should meet with, um, you may very well find yourself six months down the road and you've had all sorts of meetings and you have no checks. <coughs> so, and then on the, on the process, what I would say is, Educate yourself. There are some good books, there are some good articles, uh, good resources on the Angel Capital Association website. Uh, you can find lots of, of good information. Remember that every, everyone writing those articles has some personal bias of, of sorts. And so you, just because one person says the ideal solution to this situation is a convertible note, maybe. The other thing about educating yourself on the process is educate yourself on the process here. The process here is different than Silicon Valley. It's different than Boston. Uh, it, it has its own nuances. I actually think here it is a, a more understandable uh, process and more within your control. But I would also say it's less like a playbook and more like a uh, relationship based. So Chris, can I ask a question? Absolutely. So I'm curious on that last comment that you made. Uh, Mike just alluded to the fact that we're one percent of the population, less one, less than one percent of the investment. So we've got to see investment outside of Des Moines, outside of Iowa. Well, I would call, so, I would, so, ahead, how do, so how do you how do you if you're in the founder seat and you say, hey, we're different. We do it different here in Iowa than they do on, in the Valley than they do in Boston. How's the founder to structure that right to say, hey, I'm trying to, I'm trying to syndicate around or I'm trying to put around together. Mm -hmm. And I want to play, you know, in my in my backyard to the extent that I can, but I've also got to seek outside. Yeah. And investors on the coast, as we know, will look at deals very differently than folks do here. That's a really good question. I've got I've got a number of answers that kind of cut different directions. So what stage you're at? If you're at the early stage and you have a good idea and a good plan, you can probably source that capital here locally. Now, when you do that. Don't source that in some sort of a, a jerry-rigged method that, that the people on the coast are going to say, what did you do? You know, that, that won't work. 
Um, the other thing I would say is if you have a larger need because maybe you're further on that continuum that Sheldon showed, is I would say you may reach a point, you certainly reach a point as you get further on a continuum where the, the investors that you need will need to be larger, which means there will be fewer of them. If you're needing, if you want to do kind of a, a high net worth accredited investor raise, you might, you might, there are <coughs> folks that, uh, in the room even that have gotten a few million dollars, several million dollars with that kind of a raise without having to go find VC type money. Uh, so locally, locally. Um, you, once you get past that, you are now, now you're, now you're looking at funds, maybe smaller funds, earlier stage funds, but funds. Well, the universe of funds in, in our state is growing, but it's not as, as, as big as on the coast, certainly. There are also more funds that are sort of regional or, or industry-based that are, that are looking at Iowa. You know, we kind of talk about, oh, you used to be the flyover state, but now um, I just look at my own calendar and see how many, how many outside uh, funds or investment banking type folks are wanting to stop in, just want to visit, get to know you. Um, so you might find introductions to the to the right funds through people here locally. Uh, but but to your point, I think I think probably the best answer is depending on how much you need, uh, you may need to go external. You also want to, if you're at that larger stage, you at least may want to look external if you don't like the answers you're getting local. Right? Just because you know somebody have a long-standing relationship and then they give you a term sheet, it might you know it might hurt. <laughs> you might look at it and say, "No, nah, that doesn't seem what I want." So then you then you explore uh, on a on a larger you, you cast a broader net. Uh, that's when you're going to have fewer direct relationships, but you may have some. Um, that's when you're when you're going to funds uh, outside the state. That's when you're probably going to need to be <coughs> really targeted and understand. If you're if you're uh, pitching a, uh, uh, a piece of agricultural equipment, that's going to be a different fund than if you're pitching a, a SaaS model in a technology play. Did that answer. The right investors. I kind of touched on this really on the on the uh, last one, but but who makes sense for the stage you are at? And if if it's a local raise. You can probably get to know the people a little bit. You can get to know people who know the people you're talking to. Uh, there are folks that are very, very helpful to have in your cap table. You know, some, some angels, angels in this room who are very strategic, very experienced, very helpful, and will, will devote their time to you. There's other, other folks that uh, if you check around, you might find them like, you know, maybe I don't need that money that bad. Maybe I, maybe I can I'd do with that. So the right investors, that also uh, in, in includes when I was talking about if you're going to like funds or, or maybe, maybe angel groups, look at what their space is. If, if you will, it's not that it will cause any harm to your company, but time is, time is money and time is, is execution at an early stage. And so if you are talking to the wrong group of people, they may, they may uh, think oh, this, this will be entertaining. You know, they don't have any ill will, but they'll have a conversation with you, but they're just never gonna be check writers. And you just don't have time for that. Overcomplicating the company or the offering structure. I don't see it too often with the company. Sometimes with the offering structure, um, uh, you know, I mentioned the need to educate yourself on the various alternatives that you have. Sometimes people, you, you can always tell they've, they've read enough articles that they're looking for the coolest kind of security you can find. So, you know, it uh, bells and whistles of participation and a, and a, and a two times preference and, a, and a three classes and tiered investment. And, and you look at it and you say, oh, that's not necessary. And the more complication you have, the harder it is to explain. The more complication you have, the harder it is for the next round. I would say, you know, if you can, um, if you can go out and raise uh, cash for common stock equity investments with no special rights, hey, do it all day long. Chances are you can't, but if you can. So you, you start at the simplest, and then how much complexity do I need to have? And if you don't need any more than that, don't, don't add any more than that. Prior round of stage. Uh, this is an important one. Because sometimes, not very often, but sometimes they can be so severe they're almost unfixable. There are, especially if you're next Somewhere down the road, you're going to try to raise a, an institutional round with sophisticated 
uh, folks and sophisticated lawyers, for example, are going to say, you know, you, you back to uh, uh, Gabe asked a question about securities exemptions. You know, this this raise, and it might have been a really small raise, you know, this raise, you blew a securities exemption. You violated a securities law. We can't unring that bell. Depending on their risk tolerance, sometimes we can say, well, we can kind of unring it, right? We could we could uh, uh, we could redeem them. That 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 cleans it up. We could. We could offer them a rescission, right? We can do some things, but if you do it right the first time, you don't need to worry about that. Now, you will get people, uh, institutional folks, who say, well, I don't really like this raise you did earlier here. Uh, there will be things they don't like, and, and sometimes the next rounds are a negotiation between the current investors, the ones coming in, and the prior investors. Um, but that, that issue I just raised kind of implicates a whole bunch of my slides, and that is if your prior investors are reasonable people who understand, then that means they probably didn't overreach on their investment. And if perhaps they, they didn't overreach, but perhaps they have a term that the new round of money doesn't like, uh, it may become a negotiation. Uh, there was, yes? Uh, sorry, before you go to the sure. next stage, back to that, uh, the nitty-gritty of that early stage, you're raising 25 grand from grand, friends and family, mm -hmm. and you have a lawyer help you put together that initial piece of paper that they're right. signing. Is the lawyer helping you catch that these people are or not accredited? I mean, friends and family, it's going to be... Yeah, friends and family. Easy to pull five thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah we're, we're probably we're probably going to find a way to make that work. And the, and friends and family, I'm less concerned about the accredited the accredited status. You, what what does come into play though probably is some of the timelines. So there's a, an exemption. I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds because I have securities laws. While I have to know them, they, they are really boring for a for a presentation. <laughs> well, uh, I don't want to make mistakes. Right. It's absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Well, there, there's a. Uh, a 504 offering, which is below a million dollars, and you can do unlimited, you can do unaccredited investors, and that all that all works pretty well. The thing that, that you'll want to talk to your lawyer about is if I do that now, and then in the next, within the next year, I'm going to be raising more money. Now you start to get into this thing called integration. And integration for purposes of securities means if you did one round and now you're going to do another round and they're close enough in time and close enough in, in, in structure, they become merged into one round. So you, in its, in its sort of worst case scenario, you could have a first round that's securities law compliant under some exemption or another, and a second round standing on its own that would be securities law compliant standing on its own, but they're too close in time and too close in structure. They come together and combine, they don't comply. So you just that sounds maybe a little scarier than it is, but you do want to talk to your lawyer. Yep, yep. Uh, two slides, all right. This one's an easy one. Equity is a cash substitute. This is probably not politically correct, but the old, the old expression of spending money like a drunken sailor. Sometimes you see early stage companies that, well, yeah, I can't tell you, I'm cash, I got some stock for you. I'm kind of, you know, I'm that. And, and you start to look at the cap table and it's it's a mess because you have a bunch of you, you know a bunch of service providers or or maybe just just a just a friend who's kind of a sounding board and he's got a couple thousand shares and this person that person and they didn't ever think about uh, about securities exemptions they didn't ever think about what impact uh, that would have on on later investors and a lot of times those later investors come in and say what's this why 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 is this person here and a lot of times there are bad answers for that so I would just say just be careful. Um, you are short on cash, and you do have equity, but it's it's certainly not free. Especially the better you do, the more that costs you. Chris, I might add one comment on that. Yeah, we see that a lot as well, where it's you know an outsourced developer or someone else stepping in, and somebody's granted X percentage of the company. It's not even paper, right? So if you're gonna mm -hmm. do it again, have a good counsel help you for all of this. We, we've had situations where somebody thinks they own 5% of the company and can never be diluted. You can go through all the rounds and then, you know, and it's, again, it's back to actually cleaning up all of these prior mistakes before you can actually <coughs> raise a round. So if you're going to do something like that, don't don't just have it verbal, paper it. Yeah, that's, that's, paper that's a good point. <laughs> Would you define paper it? It has to have actually the security agreement documented that they have a lot of times in these situations, the, the person even getting the equity and the person receiving the equity not necessarily understand what it truly means 
and we've dealt with a lot of issues where even legal gets involved from a, a litigation perspective because they think they own pieces of the company and they really don't. Um, and that can, that can scare an investor away. Yes, and, and it, we, we've had common clients yeah. where, we, where we were literally saying, what's the cap table? And they're like, they give you a piece of paper and then they start saying, well then, but you know, Bill owns um, so them and you know, Sarah has some. Um, and you're, where, where are Bill and Sarah, where are they? Um, the other thing I, I will say, um, it's not on my slides, I'll, I'll close up here pretty quickly. Um, so JD used, used like the, the, the dirty words of, of, of non-dilutable, basically, basically people that, and it's surprising that people sometimes, and, and I've had a conversation about this just recently, uh, about somebody who wants to put in some money and, and never be diluted ever. Um, that's an example of a term that's just wacky and out of market. You know, you'll hear this expression, is it market? Well, is it, market is fluid to a certain degree. What's market in Iowa is different than what's market on the coast. That's not market anywhere. And so if somebody's asking for something that, that just makes you think, or, or if you don't know, ask your advisors, um, will this impact me later? That exact term right there will absolutely haunt you for the rest of your business life. So, so you, you gotta be somewhere in the realm of reasonable. And the last thing is, uh, I have is, is not having the right teams. And by that, I mean both internal and external. Uh, internal, you are going to have whatever team that you can come up with as an early stage company with limited, uh, limited resources and, and uh, uh, more needs than resources. Got to figure that part out. Don't make promises that you can't deliver on. Don't make promises that you'll regret later. You may be, you may be uh, uh, bootstrapping for a while. Externally, um, external advisors are, first of all, they're important. Second of all, you want to get the right ones, people that know this space. This is different than building a residential real estate deal. Uh, and so you want folks that have done it before. What works really slick, frankly, is if you have people who have done it, have advised on this a lot, and have advised with your other advisors, it becomes almost seamless then. Uh, but in any event, what, what's really important is some of those mistakes we I talked about earlier can be easily avoided if you've got the right team, uh, internal and the right team, external. And I think I've gone over by a couple minutes, but if anybody has any questions. Can I just add a comment? Sure. On this advisory thing, if you're gonna have somebody's advisor and you're going to list them on a document, please ask. <laughs> um, there are people in this room who are advisors to many startups who love doing it, but there are legalities about being called as an advisor, especially in the securities world. And I've had phone calls where people say, well, so-and-so says you're an advisor, and I say, I don't even know that person's name. Mm -hmm. So if you put my name on something, and I talked to you four years ago and I don't remember your name, you want to call me and tell me, Mike, four years ago you did some advising, I'd like to put you on my deck, and at least allow me to say, or allow JD or these people in the back of the room to say, sure, or no, I'm really not comfortable with that until I see what you're doing. It can make you look really, really bad, and it can cause some people problems. So, yeah, I don't know about you, much of a sense of humor about that either. I don't, I don't have any <laughs> humor about that. Yeah, yeah that, 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 that stamp of, of your name on something is a big deal, uh, and, and uh, you know, You'll, you'll find that that your advisors that are that are really in with you um, will be super proactive and helpful as much as they can be. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, by the way, that they want you um, always, you know, saying this person, for example, this person is an investor, or this person is this or that. Um, they'll be helpful, but you want to, you know, res be respectful of that. And, and, and oftentimes they'll say, you know, you know, if I'm legal counsel for a company, I'm absolutely comfortable with people telling that. Now, do I want that? Sometimes people think, well, if I get the right names in my term sheet, that'll be really impressive for people. Not so much. Not so much. Yes? Just quickly, with regards to team, what are your thoughts on, generally, on vesting um, share options with your team? Vesting for, for, uh, for founders? Yeah. Uh, or, or team members who are early stage yeah, involved? Absolutely. Vesting is, is a way to uh, give yourself some time to see if it's the right team and if that team holds together. And if, you know, if somebody's not going to be there for a year or two from now, then should they have equity? I think vesting is absolutely, if you feel like you want them to have equity, but you want that safeguard, uh, a vesting requirement is, is, is a great idea. It's not complicated. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Sure, we've come in, uh, Page. Page. All right. Thanks, Chris. Hey everyone, page 11. Uh, mostly a startup advocate and 
investor in angel deals, seed deals. Uh, I'm going to take you through some of the financing stages or the, the company stages also. Uh, I'm going to start with something from Guy Kawasaki and then immediately blow through some of his rules and break them. Um, <laughs> it wasn't planned, but as I was reviewing the slides in the back of the room, I realized what I had just done. So. <laughs> so, when you start a company, one of the first things you end up doing is investing sweat equity. Uh, you are working the late nights, uh, the weekends, the, the fill-in, you know, waiting in the car, all of those things. And you're getting some money from your, your friends and family. Guy calls them friends, families, and fools, the three Fs uh, in his book, Art of the Star. They're, they're not fools in that they are bad investors. They're not fools in that they're putting money where it really shouldn't go. Uh, they are your best cheerleaders. And if you saw the movie Joy last year, you saw some of those friends and family who invested in Joy. And at the time when she needed those advisors the most, they failed at it. They were giving her the absolute wrong advice at that time. Uh, if you haven't seen that movie, that's a, that's a beautiful representation of what happened in those seed rounds. Um, they'll give you the best terms you'll ever see in your fundraising uh, future. Uh, they'll, they'll be terms that you present to them that they'll never question because they trust you explicitly and implicitly. Um, and in many cases, the accelerators that, uh, that a company might go to, their terms are going to look a lot like those friends and family terms. They're simple, they're predetermined, they are generally non-negotiable <laughs> or non-negotiated. Um, and the bad word, uh, they can also be non-dilutive. Uh, many accelerator terms uh, in those initial agreements will set that uh, that investment, that $20,000 for 6%, as a non-dilutive investment, at least for the first or the second round. I've seen that, I've seen that recently, and it's uh, it, it can be a shocker uh, when you get to the later stages. Um, many accelerators, many seed stages, many early, early, early stages that uh, Sheldon referred to, uh, they come through as debt in our market, in, in the angel investment community in and around Des Moines. Uh, convertible debt notes are, are generally not seen in a positive way. Uh, whether that's good or bad, I can't judge. <laughs> there, are, there are schools of thought that say things about convertible notes, but in our market, I see fewer and fewer deals through angel groups getting funded through the debt instruments. Because people who are investing in you at this early stage, they are wanting to invest in you and they want to be participating with you in the upside. Debt leaves that kind of loosey-goosey. Uh, you don't know what you're going to get. Uh, so speaking of stages, in that seed stage, in our market, and again, this is Des Moines. <laughs> this is not Nebraska or Minnesota or Kansas City. Those three markets are markedly different than us. Uh, in our market, what we are seeing is a seed stage is about a $500,000 or less deal on a one and a half to $2 million valuation. Uh, that's not the case on the coast, and that's not the case in, the, the case in Nebraska. Uh, and as Chris refer, alluded to, this is a foundational stage of money. This can make or break future rounds. So don't just download a uh, term sheet off the net and just present it. Uh, go through that document, the three, four, five, six hundred bucks you're going to spend discussing that initial term sheet will pay off in the future. This is a, this is a critical document. What will happen with this term sheet at the, at the beginning when somebody invests in you is you might get two people who put in the entire money. You might get 30 people who want to put in $5,000. That's where the danger lies. A large number of people on your cap table means that many more signatures you need to get for the next round. That many more share certificates you need to issue. That many more votes you may need to get for the simplest of all decisions. So try and limit the number of people who are putting in money at that phase. If the person who's putting in at seed stage, whether they're putting in $5,000 or $50,000, they're going to use the same amount of time off your calendar. Somebody's 5,000 is somebody else's 50 or a million. So, so sp spend the uh, <coughs> share certificate just as wise. Uh, don't have too many people on that capital. 
Um, we'll define cap table for those people that probably don't know. Sure. That. Uh, cap table at, at, its, at its very simplest is a re uh, register of your shareholders. Who are the people? How much did they invest? What is their social security number, their birth date, and their address? You not only need it for record keeping and reporting every year, if you go to the state to raise money, even on the demo fund or uh, the proof of commercial relevance, you have to present that gap table to the state with, with all of that data. Uh, so have that have that roster, the register, clean and ready. The gap table represents people who are very emotionally invested. Uh, people who write a lot about angel investors like <coughs> Mark Sister, uh, or Fred Wilson define angel investors not just as somebody who writes a check and then forgets about you until you have a return. These are individuals who are going to want to help. The reason they're spending money and they're putting their money at risk is because they want to <coughs> live through your business, through you. They want to be a part of that business. They're not passive investors for the most part. In the later stages, investors become passive and have less and less interaction with you. But in the angel seed stages, they want to be participating. Uh, the worst ones will control you. <laughs> they will control your decisions on hiring. They'll control your decisions on firing. They'll control how you set up your board. They'll control how long your board meetings are. They'll control what you share in the board meeting. Uh, so. If they're allowed to. Pardon me? If they're allowed to. Chances are, if you went into it easy without proper documentation, they, they will still do it. <laughs> they'll, they'll still call you. Um, so, basic term sheets will say, in this clean seed round, and they, these are terms that will come more familiar by the, end of, by the end of this day. You'll be raising equity at one time to preference. So you'll be, you're not probably giving any board seed in this seed round of a this, of this small amount of money. You're promising quarterly reporting, not weekly, not monthly, <laughs> uh, and hopefully not annually. And, and a small dividend that represents the investment's value to you and to the investor. They're investing money for a reason. They could just as easily invest money in the stock market, but they're investing in a high risk, early stage company for a reason. So have, have some return back to the investor. So again, going back to our market, a Series A, and there are, there are exceptions to this, but in our market, a series A looks something like a one, one and a half to two million round on a five million-ish valuation. Uh, here, you are coming out as a company that's a legitimate enterprise already. You have employees, you have customers, you have some semblance of formality around you. Uh, you have to find your tax forms. The, the state of Iowa knows that you are a withholding taxpayer. They know that you have paid unemployment uh, uh, insurance date. You have a workers' comp certificate. Uh, uh, you have a PL and l balance sheet. Uh, I have an entrepreneur in this room who was raising money at this level. And in our, in our meeting, I asked for the documents that define this company, uh, essentially the deal room, right? And I asked for those documents, and his promise was to have it here, you know, within the hour or so. And within the hour, I had a Dropbox link with every single one of these documents. What did that do? As I was leaving that meeting, it cemented in my mind that the company was formal, and it could raise that. It was a grown. Um, HR, this is where problems happen, right? Human resources. People don't like changes to benefits and their employment statuses. So human resources should be formalized. There should be an employment contract um, with your employees. If you have a CEO or CFO, or even um, even a vacation policy document, write it down. Even if it's on a single sheet of paper, it doesn't have to be principal financial groups employee handbook. It can be a single <coughs> sheet of paper that states what you intend. Um, a lot of times, investors are looking at the value you're going to create, not based on what's in your head, but what are customers telling you. And they will val validate that information through potential customers. This is critical to present neatly, nicely, truthfully, and fairly, showing that you, there is a market for your business. Somebody has looked at your product and said, I will buy it, or I am buying it. If, if they are buying it, that's awesome. If they say they will buy it, 
that's still a, still, a, still an affirmation of, of your dream possibly becoming a reality. Series A in our market requires a certain number of customers coming back to you over and over. Without those customers, it's not a series A. Not even in the eyes of the state many times so that's writing a, a, uh, a demo fund loan. Even they are looking for market validation that can be at least proven. You're writing that in and say, I affirm that there is this market for my product. Moving forward on that series A, this is when you're truly past now the angel groups, you're past. Uh, the early stage investors, past your friends and family. This is Series B. You are growing. You're making money. You have lots of employees. Chances are you have a physical location. And you're probably going to raise somewhere between <coughs> 2 to $5 million in our market on an 8, 10, 15 million dollar valuation. This is real. At this point, the earliest investors may actually get bought out. Um, We've gone through recent deals in our market where those early investors either have been purchased out or, are, or have been phasing uh, out, or have a phase out plan already established for them. Here, lots and lots of reputable, repeatable, demonstrable customers who will vouch for you as a real company. That kind of money is not going to come in in early phases of a business. You're probably not leaving an accelerator raising $2 million in our market. Because in an accelerator, you probably have not created that level of market validation yet. Uh, there's a good chance you may need to provide, that you will need to provide audited financials. Uh, that, it shows that not only do you have sufficient depth in the books, but that you can afford a twenty to $30,000 audit, a basic audit, um, to show your financial strength. <coughs> Uh, your taxes should be uh, should be visible. Uh, it, you know, two, three, four years tax returns should be a part of this data at this point. Um, you're not encumbered by any uh, any legal uh, problems. So if there are legal problems like a lawsuit, like patent infringement kind of issues, those have to be documented in this kind of a race. Um, what you may have had, and I think we touched it uh, earlier, uh, what you may have had in a team uh, in, in early stages, uh, it's common to have a, uh, the, the derogatory term would be a rented suit for a CEO or a CFO. Uh, but here you won't have, here you are real. Uh, as a real company, the, the individuals who are running the company, regardless of the title, the individuals that are running the company have to be real, full-time, committed, present at the company for the investors to see, feel, touch, talk. Um, unlike the past three areas, the seed, the angel, series A rounds, financial projections now are no longer your hallucinations or dreams. That's all they are in seed stages, right? But here, they are based on real measurable numbers that are represented in the financial statements in your tax returns. These things have to be true, and repeatable and presentable. <laughs> it's going to come up over and over again. That's what an audit's all about, right? Can you come at numbers from four different angles and reach the same, <clears throat> same figure? That's what financial projections will also. Mean. So these are these are some of the things as you're growing in the positive sense. We have seen, we've known of, you know, again in our market, where everything positive doesn't happen. What if you reach a stage where you raised? money at such a high clip in those early phases of, of your company being uh, the, 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 the media darling and the, the, the sexy reports and all of that stuff, what happens if things don't work? Chances are given you're going to need money at a, what's called a down round. Your valuation that had gone up from that half from a million to eight to ten million may now be reset downward. What happens? One, it's a, it's a downer in, in knowing that your stock has fallen in value, both to the founder, but also to the investors. So here, early investors who believed in you, some of them might lose that faith, and that's okay. It's okay for them to lose faith, because at this time, you don't want to lose the company. Uh, don't expect everybody will invest in this downer. Some will just want to cut their losses. 
um, when a down round happens, in that down round, somebody is going to invest a small amount of money, a million bucks maybe, just to give you CPR. That million bucks is going to come extremely expensive. It is going to be so expensive that you're probably going to lose your position as the CPR. Somebody else will be placed by the funding entity as the CPR. Uh, you're likely going to lose some of the perks. You're going to likely lose some of the titles, some of the, I mean, the fat trimming is, is truly across the board because the investor coming in now wants to create profit. Uh, just like CPR, this is, this is, a, this is, a, this is a crazy event. Yeah. But this could help you survive. It, could, it, it has brought companies out of near death. Um, again, we know them in our market right now. So this, this could also happen. There is, a, there is a series of early decisions that can lead to this situation. And that series of early decisions can be too high a valuation or too much money raised in the earliest phases of the company. Imagine you have no product, no customers, uh, no company, but you raise money at a $5 million valuation. You were able to sell. And now you have to let or have the rubber meet the road. Well, rubber never touches the road. So you try and raise a little more money, you can still sell your dream, you raise the next round a little bit higher. By the time investors start asking real questions on that company, they're going to realize that that five million and the six million valuations was too high. And they're gonna bring, bring the value down to a down round. And, become, and make it more interesting. So raising too much money in the early phases can also be just a, can, can be one of those bad things. So you want to plan those, and, and Chris talked about some of those bad decisions earlier. Um, so th these are the key, key phases, the key stages that a company goes through. A company doesn't have to go through any of these stages. It may just go through the seed stage, the friends and family stage, and be done, uh, and, and raise the rest of the money on revenue. But if you're in the <coughs> private equity market to raise money for your business, it's probably not worth it. I have a question. Kind of sure. One of the big uh, companies I was talking about was Theranis, obviously. You know, they went up to a billion dollar valuation and they just dropped way down to literally nothing overnight. Is it, I mean, at that point, are they basically going to verge bankruptcy? Or are they going to basically significant down, down round where they're going to basically re something and restructure everything? I mean, it's a rarity that happens, but I'm just kind of curious what would happen in that kind of because it was such a high run such a quick drop -off. This is where they're into problems, right? Mm -hmm. Regulatory problems. Um, it'll likely be a down run. Uh, it is done. Yeah. It, it is. Can the company survive? Sure it can. Uh, they just yeah. now need to go back and tie up the loose ends on what what they were saying has now to be proven true. Um, there's a, I, I had never heard this saying until last week uh, at an angel conference. But a lot, a lot of companies that raise money for medical uh, devices or medical uh, deals uh, tell you that you know this is a five, eight, ten year long process. And so many investors say they don't do drugs. You know, they don't want to deal with the regulatory hassle. They don't want to wait for the eight years that it takes to draw the first dollar. Uh, that's how long some of these uh, regulations take. If you're in a government uh, uh, government contracting business, but I'm going to tell you, it's, it, it takes two years, sometimes three years, just to go through a single RFP and its competition. Not everybody has the, the stomach to wait three years to do a $2 million deal. Uh, so regulations can sometimes uh, cause, or filings can sometimes cause uh, the need for money, and need for money at the worst possible time. You may need to raise money at a 30% interest rate because you just have to survive those two months while you're waiting for the for a government pay to pay. Okay. Any other questions? If not, we'll keep going. Oh, sorry, Brad. Um, I guess going back to Sheldon's presentation on your timeline, you, you kind of showed uh, you know seed round and then I guess another seed round potentially Series A. Um, when does that usually come about in your experience as far as, you know, the Series A kind of 1.5 or above, you may have raised the seed round, and then raising a second seed round. What are some of the challenges with that? Or yeah, two yeah. things will determine that velocity. 
So first thing that will determine velocity is your ability to execute on your plan. If you're, if you're executing so fast that you blow through your projections of where your company will be and spend that money that you raised in the seed round. So let's say your, your seed round was to develop the MVP, or the, uh, the friend's family round was to develop MVP. And you get the MVP done in three weeks because you're just a good developer yourself. You get that done, now you're ready for the next round. You could accelerate that time frame to, to a lot quicker. Um, some of the, the one thing that will slow you down is the securities exemptions that you might have used to raise the money. Because there are calendar timelines that, that require how much and how often can you raise pocket dollars. So those, those could slow you down, but the seed angel rounds, those, it, the velocity is determined by your ability to execute. Going out to raise money too fast uh, is going to take your eyes off the ball, right? Because because it, it, raising money is a full time job. Yeah. Thank you. Any others? All right, Jaden, Matt.